am the chief architect of Elementary IP. Uh, Sumit Sandhu over there, uh, she is the CEO of the company, and she is also our in-house uh, machine learning expert. So um, Sumit will be presenting in the second half of the presentation. So just a, a, a brief uh, introduction of who we are. Uh, we are a Silicon Valley startup. Uh, we started back in April 2014. Um, we build a SaaS tool for uh, legal professionals or, uh, or patent searchers to do patent analysis and patent management. Um, so we provide high performance searching, um, document comparison, side by side comparison, looking for similarities between documents, and uh, we also do portfolio analysis. Um, so the technology we use is uh, deep learning. Um, uh, natural language processing. We heavily use open source, and we also have our own secret source, our proprietary um, algorithm in Python. And the reason why we're here today is that we owe a lot to Python and open source community. Uh, we're here just to share our experience and our learning. So technical overview, I'll be presenting the overview. So what we're gonna do is to have a overview high level uh, diagram or high, high level description of the system and different major software components and share lessons that we have learned in terms of architecture. And then Sumi will dive uh, deeper into Python learning. Okay, so um, as I mentioned earlier, we, are, we provide a search. Um, search is not surprising, really. Uh, whenever you go to any web application, you expect to have a search. Um, it's not that hard uh, if you're just doing a out-of-the-box uh, free text search uh, because you just put your documents in Solar or Elasticsearch, and there you go, you have a search. Um, what we're offering is a little bit unique. Uh, what we're offering is similarity search. Um, there are two types of similarity search that we're offering. One is the macro searching and the other one is micro searching. Well, what do we mean by macro searching? Macro searching is basically given some phrase that you uh, enter or in our case even giving a, a pattern. Um, a lot of times pattern searcher given a pattern, they want to look for similarities. Who, what patterns that are similar to the one that I'm looking at? Um, so that's what we mean by macro searching. So given a pattern or given a, some phrase and terms that you type in and we return a list of patterns that are similar to the ones that you're looking at. Now the similarity not just limited on synonyms. Uh, a lot of times uh, in s technical areas, the technical terms change over time even though they might be talking about the same thing. So, um, so that's macro searching. And micro searching is searching within the document. Um, so this is providing a side-by-side -side comparison of two patterns. So when we say, well, those two patterns are similar, so um, oftentimes the searcher wants to know, well, how are they similar? So micro searching providing a way for the application to identify to the user which area of the patterns are similar and the ability to highlight the similar um, areas within the pattern, so similar sentences, what we call. Um, so that allowed the patent searcher to quick, quickly go through a large number of patterns very quickly. So uh, our application consists of two parts. Now, um, what's behind the macro and micro searching is word models. Uh, we train our word models uh, by processing billions of terms in hundreds of millions of patterns. Um, so those two searches are based on the word models that we created using machine learning um, algorithm. So the top part, the, the pink uh, processing is the backend processing. As you could imagine, there's a lot of uh, document crunching data processing. That is the backend, that's our offline uh, batch processing. Uh, we can't really do that real time because there's so much data. Um, the, what's the real time application at the bottom is the yellow part. Uh, in addition, so after we create a model, what we have is an online application where people can log in and they do their pattern search and they can save their pattern and they can, um, and then they, we also uh, have a productivity tool to allow people to do um, analysis, to do annotations on the pattern and come back later and save the patterns and come back and look, look at the patterns further. And then finally, the goal is to allow them to be able to export uh, what their, what their uh, findings are. So the key software components, this is mostly just the online application. Our batch processing is primarily in Python. Um, 
And this is the architecture of the major software components for the online application. Uh, on the top of that is the web server. Um, the web server is Java, Tomcat. Um, and so the web server takes requests from the user. It's a web application um, on the, on, on, in the cloud. Um, so the web server basically just dispatching the user request to different uh, software components, uh, Python being one, uh, Python's the ability, leveraging Python's ability to return us the related terms, right, given what the user type in to be able to identify a list of terms that could be potentially related to what they enter, and then do similarity search. Um, Solar is allow, it's, it's a search engine, allow us to allow a uh, user uh, to be able to search uh, on the patterns that they have saved. Um, MySQL is just a, mo a lot of its bookkeeping uh, relationship um, between annotation and user and pattern. So uh, architecture, this is the beginning. Uh, we started out with pretty simple. We wanted to keep things simple. Um, so there are individual software components like Python, Java, Solar, and MySQL. They all run independently. Um, they running on the host platform. We have uh, developers on different platforms. Some are on Windows, some are on Mac, uh, Linux, uh, pretty diverse uh, set of OS. Um, that worked well up to a certain point until we know we have to periodically update the uh, libraries in Python. Um, so the, that creates a lot of inefficiency because when you upgrade Python, especially the machine learning packages, a lot of times uh, it's rather sensitive to the underlying platform. Um, so what it has to create is a architecture challenge. Basically, every time we need to upgrade, um, everyone has to upgrade. Now we end up losing a lot of time. We are a pretty small company. We can't afford to have people spend hours upgrading their library. Um, so what we end up doing is that we end up using uh, Docker um, containerization. Uh, basically, we, what we do is that we create images on each one of these software components. Um, we, uh, so each one of them run independently and they are, they are isolated. And um, so in, in, the case that, in the case that we use Docker, um, what we do is that now we, all we need to do is just build a Docker image once, right? So somebody just install the latest library um, and publish the image onto Docker. This is particularly true with Python. And the developers just need to pull the, doc, the Python images into their, into their uh, local system, and then they uh, run the container off the image. Yeah, so now with the architecture is that in, in the production side, we run on Google Cloud uh, operating system, um, depending on, well, if you're running on your local machine, you're not on cloud, but you might have different operating system, Windows, Mac, Linux. And virtual machine, if you're on Linux, you don't need to have a virtual machine. But if you're on Windows, you're on Mac, you need to have a virtual machine. Uh, and then Docker engine run on top of that, and on top of that, the, the containers that are specific to us, to our application. Um, does everybody know what Docker is? Yeah? So I don't need to talk about Docker? OK, good. Okay, um, the second architectural, architectural challenge. Um, we were running pretty okay uh, for a while um, until we hit some performance problem. Uh, we have uh, what, if you can see on the left diagram there, we have Python and Java in the same container. Um, the reason why we have them in the same container is that because Java actually explicitly call out, uh, make a system call to Python to whenever it needs to call a Python function. Um, so there is a problem with that, uh, especially when we when our, our word model gets really large. Um, so actually, it, we at a point that we hit a roadblock. Basically, uh, the similarity search costs us 26 seconds to run. Um, that's totally not acceptable uh, in real time. Uh, so what we end up doing is we breaking Python and Java. Uh, we decouple them basically. So instead of um, having uh, Java call Python, whenever we do that, uh, first of all, it needs to load Python into the system, into memory, and second of all, we have to load the work model into memory. So now we break Python separately, and Python is running as an independent server. So Python will start up with the work model already in memory, and it's up and ready to go, and whenever Java needs to have some Python, invoke some Python function, we just need to do messaging. So we send a message over the socket, 
and send it over to Python. And so we drop out, we, our performance increased from you know, 26 seconds to less than a second, actually. So now we arrive at, that po at this point. Um, so now we have Python, Java, Solar, MySQL. They're all running in their own separate container. And we have a little piece uh, JavaScript uh, for a client-side user interaction. And we use D3 for visualization. Um, just for fun, give you a couple examples what we um, use D3 for. Uh, D3, we use D3 at this point is to show the relationship between terms. Um, so if you're looking for the term wireless, um, it, using our word model, it returns a list of related terms. Um, the size of the circle indicate how frequently the terms appear um, in the documents. And the edge between the circle indicate that how uh, closely related a term is to the root term uh, wireless. Okay, so we have a couple of uh, visual reference representation. One is the graph on the left, and we also have a tree graph. Um, for people to play with. The nice thing about D3 is it's data-driven um, and also interactive. You can expand and close um, or you can drag it around and it's kind of a fun toy to, for people to play with and it's also a good visualization. Okay, with that, um, Sumit will talk about Python. Um, yeah, the total patents are probably 100 million, including global. Um, so for a reasonable model, we need about 2 billion-ish words, which is about between 50,000 to 200,000 patents. So we look for patents in a class. Usually it makes sense to model one technology class on its own. Um, otherwise, you have too much too many different words with different contexts in the same model. Lab. So right now we're keeping patent classes different. So patents are classified by their technology class for those that may not have uh, seen that. All right, so let's look at uh, the algorithms a little bit in a little bit of detail. So by the way, I'm a double E, so if there are any basic computer science questions, that's for Tammy. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, it's a simple, uh, four-stage uh, data flow acquisition, processing, AI modeling, and similarity search. Um, we grab patents from the web. You can grab them from the PTO or, or other public sources. Um, then we do natural language processing and save uh, proprietary metadata in XML and HTML. Then we use uh, context-based word models, uh, and we use GenSim for that. And finally, we end up with similarity search, similar terms, sentences, patents, and a free text kind of a search. Um, the specific uh, packages, most of you are familiar with these. Um, beautiful soup, which is awesome. Um, and we use a lot of regular expressions. Uh, NLTK was what we started out with for some of the data processing, and I'll talk about that further. Uh, GenSim, which is awesome, really fast for AI modeling. And for similarity search, we further use NumPy and Scikit-learn. So let's look at the performance challenges a little bit uh, deeper. So at, at our first cut of architecture, here's what it looks like. Um, Data acquisition is fast in the sense that there's only so much you can do about it. it, it in the end, it's the network speed that dominates that. Um, data processing is our slowest point right now because we're doing a lot of stuff. We're doing uh, a lot of NLP and then we're trying to save it in, in our own format. So that is the slowest point and we'll deeper dive into that in the next few slides. Um, AI modeling, GenSim, awesome. Uh, it's optimized in Cython, blazing fast. We're happy with that. Similarity search is a little bit slow, but we think we can speed it up. So let's de uh, dive into the data processing in a little more detail. Again, it's a simple four-stage uh, process. Use parts of speech tagging, then we chunk and save phrases, which as all of you know, this is sort of rule-based. You know, you're trying to get the right nouns and not the junk adjectives or the verbs. Um, so we do this and we chunk the parts of speech tags into groups, noun or verb phrases. Um, and in patents, because they're written in this very strange language, at least the claims, um, sometimes the lawyers are deliberately trying to confuse you and hide the actual invention, so you know, it, it takes some work to kind of sift out the legalese. Um, then we combine similar phrases. This is to clean them up. Um, so for example, if we want to display a list of top most frequent phrases to the user, we want to combine those that are similar lemmas or conceptually overlapping. And this is actually a pretty uh, 
intensive, uh, it started out being a pretty intensive, uh, co compute intensive uh, stage as well. And then we marked them up in the original text uh, for display as well as for use in XML and other purposes. So we started out with NLTK for the first two stages, very slow. So parts of speech tagging is pretty slow. Um, and chunking is actually okay. Uh, combining was, we had a very naive implementation, doubly. So <laughs> forgot my CS. Um, and then we marked them up in text, which is somewhat slow, but not too bad. So what we'll do now is look at sort of the four stages and what we did to uh, actually bring the CS back in. Um, so parts of speech tagging. Um, so the default NLTK tagger is, is slow. Um, we tried this back at Spacey. Um, it's new and it uses Cython, just like Gensim, uh, to optimize speed. Um, we, so we uh, tagged just the description section and we're showing you two examples and the size of those patterns in sentences and tokens. Um, one is small, short, is a small pattern, the other is a longer pattern. Um, and we tried two different approaches. We tried tagging them sentence by sentence or we sent in the whole description, the whole bulk text into it. And we found very different behavior. So, Spacey is actually 77 times faster than NLTK for parts of speech tagging, only parts of speech tagging. We didn't do dependency parsing because we're, we're not there yet. So just for that, it's, it's faster for short sentences. But if you feed it like large sections of text, it loses its advantage. So assume that their uh, sentence tokenization is slow or other things are slow still in Spacey. But, but if you can just spit in sentences, blazing fast. And it's higher quality. Um, they actually had better, uh, better quality labels than NLTK does. NLTK, for example, couldn't figure out the word comprise. Comprise is a common word and every pattern will have comprise in the claims. So, didn't work for us. Um, next phase is uh, phrase chunking. So we wanna mark noun or uh, verb phrases because later on we wanna use this information. Noun phrases tend to be more informative. Verbs are just too generic sometimes to be even useful to look at. So we label them. And there's typically hundreds to thousands of these phrases that we find per patent. Then the question was, um, how do we store them? Um, and then how do we figure out if we have multiple instances of the same phrase, sometimes they are in, uh, inconsistent. So because of errors in the underlying tagging, they don't always look like a noun or a verb phrase. So we had to then use majority logic to uh, reconcile the uh, different uh, labels. So we tried two different methods. We tried cumulative smoothing, where we would save all of the phrase labels in a list and then go back and then try to uh, reconcile them with smoothing. Um, or we did in place where we save them as a dictionary, as items, and the moment you grab a new one, uh, you smooth it right there. So obviously, the dictionary smoothing is faster. It's, a, it's like a hash table, and it's 40% faster uh, than using a list. So that's, that's useful learning. We can uh, immediately implement that. So the next stage, I'm actually gonna switch the stages a little bit. I'm gonna talk about marking up phrases first. Um, so after we clean them up, we wanna mark them up in the XML or HTML, and we tried uh, regular expression versus string. And we found that string is 44% faster, and these are all uh, results for 20 patents. So we expect they'll scale hugely for hundreds of thousands of patents. But we were happy to see these, you know, close to 50% improvements. Um, so this is the, actually the third stage where we combine similar phrases. Um, and here again, we have a choice. We had to get creative with using the string uh, strength of Python. First, we did try the list. So we wanna combine phrases that have commonality like packet switch, packet switching, fast packet switching networks. Conceptually, they're all about the same thing. So when, when we show them to the user, we wanna show them as a cluster. Um, so we tried two approaches. Um, for the list, we grabbed the phrases uh, first, we took all the phrases and their counts, and then we did pairwise regular expression comparisons. And for the string approach, we, tr we created this uh, list, uh, string with the phrase index and the phrase, and then, then we used a regular expression for each phrase to look for locations. So it turns out that the string representation is eight times faster than the list representation. So, so from the very beginning to the very end, and we have these incremental improvements where we um, compute regex on the fly, then we store the regular expression ahead of time, and then we store only indices and not the actual phrases. And in the end, when we went to string, boom, it was the fastest. We didn't have to do any of those incremental uh, improvements. Um, so string is a very interesting alternative to actually using lists, if, if, if you can cast the problem like that. 
And so for this section, the next steps are to try to reduce this approximately eight seconds processing time. It's still not real time. So we want to see how far we can push it in Python before we have to resort to Cython or NumPy or, or another option. And on similarity search, um, some of what we did for data processing will help with the similarity search as well. And then we're uh, going to solar and see how we can incorporate the AI word model directly in solar without losing performance. So next, I'll show you some fun examples of what we found in some uh, pattern classes. Um, so the word phone, uh, in uh, a telecommunications class, 705, um, on the left side, what you see is the first layer of nearest neighbors. So this is using the model that we created, the GenSim model. So the closest word, telephone, pager, cellular, telephones, makes sense. You expect that. On the right side, we expanded the further the nearest neighbors. So the nice thing here is, let me do this. So you see two different clusters emerge. On the rightmost, we have landline phones. So uh, some of you may not have used a landline phone. Uh, <laughs> So if you're young enough. So we have landline phones, um, fixed line, uh, wireline, bots, uh, very ancient technology. On the left side of that, we have cellular, wireless, mobile, walkie-talkie, cordless, handset. So it's nice that they're semantically related clusters as well. So if you have enough data, this actually starts to make sense and starts to be useful and informative. Yes. Yeah, so we started out just by doing a very raw model first because um, we wanted to capture nuances like, um, you know, there are errors in patterns. So entities like company names, right? If there's an error, it'll be misspelled. It'll be a, it'll be a, it'll be a upper caps, lower caps. So we wanted to see what it would do with the raw data first, and we're obviously we're going to go to uh, stemming next. We're going to go to. Um, uh, 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 multi-word phrases and all that. So we started out with just the simplest possible single token model to see what that would give us. And we actually learned a lot of things even as part of that before we munched the data too much. Um, so these are all the examples for the, these are all our first generation uh, examples. So fracking, um, we looked in the US class 166 which has to do with oil wells. So we enter fracking. On the left side, you see the first layer of neighbors. So phrasing, I thought that was a typo. Where's the, where did the K go? Uh, but then I looked up some of the patterns that had phrasing. And some of the older patterns actually use the word phrasing instead of fracking. So I wouldn't have known that, right, as a non-expert. And this model just, boom, phrasing. So searchers like this because searchers have to spend so much time, patent, professional patent searchers, they have to first explore a little, look at a few patterns, understand the terms, search again, refine their terms, and that takes days. So with this one button, and you at least know, you know what are the close terms. And then fracturing, which is more frequently used. So more patents have fracturing, and phrasing is actually a smaller, bu smaller bubble. And then hydrofracturing, and then words like job, water sand are modifiers. Fracking job, water sand fracking. So the other reason we did the single tokens was um, we wanted to see how the Modifiers would behave relative to synonyms, relative to other linguistic relations like homonyms, holonyms, blah, blah, blah. We wanted to see what this would do with that before we artificially constrained the data. And then there's something funny called huff and puff on the leftmost. So what is huff and puff? Uh, let's actually do this. Um, so that has to do with flooding, some kind of water gas flooding technique in oil wells, part of fracking. All right. Now that we've fracked the hell out of the environment, let's go to uh, looking at entities. Um, so we can do the same thing for pretty much any text, right? So uh, we can arrange the text so that we look at um, what companies are filing patents with similar titles. So these are relationships based on titles. On the left side, we have Google. On the right side, we have Facebook. And for this patent class, which is about um, monetization of software, so it's a, patent, it's a class about software, we see that Google has many more patents than Facebook in that class. Um, at least according to the model, it may be inaccurate. And the interesting thing is their neighbors, they are each other's nearest neighbor. So Facebook and Google are that close. They're each other's nearest neighbor in this patent class. And then their nearest neighbors are very similar. 
So both of them happen to have eBay, Amazon, uh, uh, Zynga, uh, A9. All, so they have very similar neighbors. So that's interesting. There's, there's a deeper, that means there's, if you didn't know about Google or Facebook, or even if you did, um, you can actually find out very interesting things from such relationships. You can find about trolls. So uh, I don't have an example in this particular case uh, uh, yet, but um, another class I looked at where I know the space better, like in wireless. So some of the companies that are actively filing patents in order to then later on um, litigate and, and uh, uh, pursue you know, larger companies, um, you can actually tell from this, because their, their titles tend to be similar because they're filing about the same topic. Or if there are transactions, when companies are buying and selling patents, that tends to get reflected here. So for example, we see that face, uh, MySpace is, is still around and presumably some of those patents might have gotten sold to uh, Facebook. Um, so MySpace is still around. Um, so there's, there's all these interesting relationships that we can see and some of them actually make sense in the business world as well, although it's just a statistical model uh, from um, World of Egg. So comparison to legacy search, um, we're just showing one example here. We're doing larger scale uh, customer uh, studies. Um, so what this shows is um, closer to traditional information retrieval. So what we did was we took um, a bunch of patents that are similar to uh, the first one, 7450489, and we ranked them by their score in the similarity search. And then we did a legacy search which is purely keywords based. And that's typically what most people do in the legal industry right now, uh, especially in patents. Um, so they did a keyword Boolean search, and we see that similarity search, because it, because it is a softer search, it found two very similar patents. Uh, and they're actually close enough to make a very good legal case for any of these involved companies. Uh, but you know, I won't tell them that, they'll probably not want to know. Um, and then the legacy search, actually the red, it just psh, misses, misses all of them because it is so narrow. It is very keyword based. But the similarity search, because it's using those other models, uh, the nearest neighbors that we found automatically, um, is able to find, uh, do a much better job. And this is just one example. So our key takeaways uh, from at least our experiments with, with, uh, with this in Python, um, so the AI and LP packages, they range from the educational, NLTK, to the industrial, GenSim and Spacey. Um, for general algorithms, a real-time speed is a challenge. It takes a lot of work to really tune them. And it would be nice if there were a concept library of typical algorithms and their optimized designs and an easy way to search. Um, I don't know if, I mean, Stack Overflow so far is how we, how we go about it, right? Is, is you just keep looking until you find something in Stack Overflow to optimize some one stage. Um, and then um, obviously Python, Java, Solar, they're each doing specific things that, that we want to leverage. Uh, for example, for our, to speed up the similarity search, we want to somehow incorporate it into Solar and um, these interfaces have to be designed carefully and then functions have to be partitioned carefully about you know, are you really leveraging what that particular block provides? And containerization really helped us uh, speed up uh, deployment and uh, implementation generally. And that is all we're gonna talk about. If there's any questions. Okay. Sure. I'm wondering, uh, you, you know, just in which does common modeling, um, how does the, the POS tagging uh, relate to that topic modeling? Is it combined or? Um, so the question is, uh, GenSim does topic modeling. How does our POS tagging relate to uh, GenSim? So we're not using their topic modeling. Um, we're using their uh, word modeling, word vector models. Um, so our parts of speech tagging and the phrase chunking goes into GenSim on top of which the models are built. You, and the results I showed you actually only, they do not include the advanced part of speech tagging that I talked about yet. Those were single token uh, examples. Yes. Um, so the question is, is prior art search the main application? Um, this can be used for all legal search, general search, right? Um, prior art is our sort of uh, the lowest hanging fruit because it is patent against patent. 
So since we're modeling on patents, it's very easy to compare two patents. Um, but we can, and we're planning to extend it to non-patent literature where you can do infringement, you can do freedom to operate, and all other kinds of searches. But that does also require being able to, you know, uh, crawl the web and get all the data automatically and, and other things. But, but we can easily compare a non-patent document to a patent. We just need the model. So what Tammy showed you in the beginning, we do this offline model building and online comparison. So once you have the model, which is, if it's broad enough, you can compare any document and you know, hopefully the words that are in the document will also be in your model most of the time. Yes. Yes. So the question is, um, are we using word to vec Are we using clustering on top? Uh, so the answer is uh, yes to both. Um, and then um, in addition to clustering, you, I mean, you have to do some fairly um, advanced. Uh, f so patents are structured. They're very structured documents. So we do some fairly uh, not quite rule-based, but we had to think rule-based to come up with uh, useful clustering um, for patents based on different patent fields. And so the question is, are we using any particular clustering algorithm? So we tried, actually, we did try all of them. Um, we tried k-means. K we tried affinity propagation. So we like affinity propagation, but, but it tends to be imbalanced sometimes. So we, um, we, right now, we're OK with k-means. You have to play with the number of uh, clusters, though. So if you have too many or too little, things start to look weird. So we really had to slap it into shape and you know, try this, try that until it looked reasonable. Um, but it's a little fragile in that sense, right? Because it's so uh, hand-picked. Um, so that, yeah, that's a good topic. Um, so one interesting thing in clustering is top topological modeling and topological clustering out of, uh, there's a company, I'm trying to remember their name, out of Stanford. Um, so, so that's actually very interesting because k-means and affinity propagation are, they're more vector space based and they, they kind of put everything into one bucket. Affinity propagation, the nice thing with that is it looks for non planar, nonlinear relationships, and it's more interesting. And then topo topological modeling is even more nonlinear. So we want to move to topological uh, clustering, I should say, topological clustering if, if, when we can. And we're kind of using that already um, a little bit. So yeah, so, if, if, so you, you, in order to differentiate right, from, from anybody who grabs just WordDovec off the shelf, there's a heck of a lot of work that, that goes into actually making this work. Yes? So the question is, um, how can we incorporate user feedback, real time or otherwise, back into the search? And that's a great question, because it relates to the clustering question. Um, just raw word to back models are very noisy. Everything is similar to everything with a non-zero number, right? Everything is similar to everything, so you get a lot of noise. Um, so that takes some work to fine tune those algorithms. And then certainly we think that the sort of the goal test will be if I had perfect user feedback, uh, into my synonyms or other words, if I already knew what the right words to use, the similar words were. So we are, we are building that into our model where we, you know, there's an option for the user to uh, select from that, that circle you saw that these are the words to use for this project. And people like that idea. They want to control over what the synonyms are. Um, so yes, definitely of interest. Yes? The question is, uh, how do we validate the models? Oh, uh, <laughs> benchmark them against what? Oh, test versus training. Um, that's a good question. So, I mean, we could do some abstract experiments to, you know. Um, look at some trained data versus this. And this, as you know, is completely unsupervised, uh, right? So it's just in the wild, you look for some uh, close context based close terms. Um, but we think it's more fruitful and, and a better use of our, our time, very limited time, to um, just go directly to the user and have them do trials, um, right? And then if they like, it's in the end, it's subjective, right? That's the problem with search. You can never, you can't even measure perfect recall or perfect precision, right? It's subjective. So 
so we're going straight to users and you know just getting them to say, okay, is this, is this getting you something you can't do today, right? Is it buying you something that's worth, uh, worth your time? Because just the fact that you can have the automatic extraction of similar words is, I mean, it's, it's amazing that you know, in the 21st century, people are still having to stick in one word, see what comes back, read the pattern, stick in a different word, right? So that's a lot of time. So even simply having the vocabulary in front of them, we think will be very valuable. And actually, people pay for these vocabularies. The patent offices, they have these, uh, the examiners, they have these proprietary you know, glossaries that they all use, and apparently people pay money for that. So Word of can just pop out, pop out you know, a lot more. Yeah, so, so that's a, it's, it's still a, it's a, that's a good topic for, for I would say at this point, um, research. We, we're trying a few things. Um, so the interesting thing we've seen is that statistics help. So um, if you cluster sentences, it actually, it's really good. So the more, the longer your sentence is, um, and then clustering them is actually fairly accurate. Uh, so it's actually probably better to do things at a larger, uh, you know, with a longer uh, piece of data. Um, but that's definitely a topic of research. We, I, we tried to use Doc2Vec a little bit. It was a little clumsy to use, and it, but at least we haven't really you know, done much with it. Um, it seemed slower. We just need to maybe look at that. But, but we wanted to start with the simplest. Part of the reason is we want to look for, here's another important uh, thing we try to extract, is what is the core invention of a patent? So some of our topolog topological uh, clustering goes into looking for what is the invention in a patent. Normally you have to just read it many, many times to understand what the heck is the patent about, right? But, but using these, we can also sort of look for the, you know, the things that stand out. So when people are patenting something, it's, it's, it's a new collection of concepts. Uh, it's an unusual collection of concepts. So that is something we're also able to extract with this. And we wanted to keep it at the word level because it's, in the end, the unit, the granularity unit we have is words. The moment we start to munge it, munge it up, uh, it loses the, you know, the kind of the information. But that's just our approach. Yes. One short question: How big are the uh, chunks you have? Like I think you said five. You called it up at like a hundred thousand. Ch ch chunks. Yeah, like what was it? You oh, the number of phrases per patent. Yeah, how big is the class? Um, classes vary. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. And can I only search on one class, or is it like, can I search across class? And yeah, so, um, so that's a, it's a good, it, that's a, up to the design choice, how you want to do it. Um, we've seen a, one company that, you know, builds a model across the entire patent database. But then you, know, you don't have differentiation between classes. Then you're back to something that looks like this, but it is much denser because it has so many more contexts, it's, it's combining and it makes it harder. So that's a design choice. But, I mean, like, couldn't I just say I wanna combine two? Yeah, so? yeah, you could combine two, you could combine similar ones, but you still, so this is what Google's new patent website does, is that they use, um, they model the entire patent. Uh, and they use you know, some kind of a vector model, but it's for the entire, it's like a do document model. Um, so they use that. Um, <sighs> So it, it does help you at the macro level, but you can't get this kind of granularity you know, with, with that model. So you still have to use maybe two models, hybrid. Okay, so you decided to just go on one question. Yeah, we wanted to get the intuition, right? We, first we wanted to make sense of it, that does it actually give us semantically useful information or not? At a granular level, at a controlled level, before we try to uh, grab too much data into it, yeah. <laughs> okay, you had to ask the difficult question. <laughs> so the question is, how do you sell your product given that there are infinite numbers of patent search tools out there? So yeah, so that's, that's another strategy in, in differentiation and sales. So, so the easy or the easy or the good thing for us is this is the latest technology. And, and legal is a very slow space, right? Evolution of technology in legal is, I don't know how many years behind usually the rest of the industry. Um, so we're obviously you know, building the right relationships and, and in the end, the customer, it's up to the customer. So the few lawyers like we were talking to um, 
a relatively um, senior attorney at a large social networking company. And what they told us was um, they would use this every day. Just the fact they can get a bird's eye view of the words, um, and then they can do a quick comparison of two patents. So, so simple productivity things we can do uh, with the similar sentence search is also very valuable. Because when companies are filing patents, they want to do a first an internal check, right? Because multiple inventors are filing the same thing again and again, and we know that. We were on our patent committees in big companies. Uh, people are just trying to get their score up, but it's, not, it's an incremental invention. So lawyers want to, want to check that quickly without having to pay somebody external to do a search, right? So this is a this is actually more valuable to the, to the IP lawyers and attorneys who just want to do a quick conceptual check, right, uh, and, and decide that. So we think corporate lawyers will be a good target for us. Um, and then, then we also want to move to the solo attorneys who can't afford these expensive tools, right? So there are two or three dominant players in patent tools, and they charge upwards of $25,000, $50,000 a year. And solo attorneys, and there's more solo attorneys that can't afford that. So that's going to be another market. But it is a small market, and we think that if we take the overall legal market, not just patents, but other legal literature, then it becomes interesting. All right, I think that's it. <laughs>